All right, today we have Jeremy Gardner, Executive Director of, the Director of the College Cryptocurrency Network and Director of Operations at Augur. Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, it's an utter pleasure. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about what is Augur and what is it that you're doing? Okay, so Augur's really cool. Tony knows all about it. But what we're doing is we're taking blockchain technology and in my mind really applying it to a consumer use case in the first world at least for the very first time by taking prediction markets or which are pretty much just markets where people bet on the outcomes of future events such as presidential elections or academic research whatever you please and and, and buy shares of yes or no of whether something's going to happen and uh, that to me is really exciting because betting is something people love to do something they traditionally have not been able to do online by putting prediction markets on the blockchain, they can do it now. So that, 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 that's uh, what Augur is. And as a quick follow-up to that, since I joined the Augur team, I got a chance to you know, go out to San Francisco and meet everyone. Um, I can't say enough about a, it. Everyone in the group is incredibly bright. They really know the product well. I learned a bunch just by hanging out with them. And the other thing I had the pleasure to do was meet Robin Hansen, someone who I wasn't really familiar with, uh, how influential he was, not just with the prediction market scene and the whole Bayesian econo or Bayesian statistics scene, but um, really a part of the early crypto scene and hanging out with the cypherpunks and Tim May and things like that. He has roots in there, and it's it's very interesting to see how close these worlds are and how they're going to get closer. And you know, this is really cool because we were able to bring Jeremy on today, and we really want to talk mostly about college crypto. But um, really, the Augur team is turning out to be like an all-star team that's trying to execute this, and um, I, I can't say enough for everyone about it. But with, with that being said, I do want to go into um, the CCN because that's actually how I met you for, at the first time, uh, Jeremy. How and why did you start this? Were you a part of what started CCN? And um, you know, tell us how big it's grown since you started it. So, so my experience with the CCN is really just reflective of my entire experience with with Bitcoin. In that, the first time I was introduced to Bitcoin was reading a Rolling Stone article about the Silk Road and how you can buy drugs on the internet now. And I was like, well, that's interesting. But it didn't seem to have much value to me. And I didn't really return to Bitcoin for another year until the fall before this, in which I w was told by my friends that the value of Bitcoin was about to skyrocket. It was at about 200 And, you know... I don't typically take my friends' investment advice, but I, I did my research. I saw the sentiment was building. Uh, so uh, then the Silk Road closed, bought in. Um, maybe it was right before or after that. But then the price shot up to $1,000. I got out. I was like, all right, this is too good to be true. Sold my Bitcoin and was like, all right, th this tool is good for buying drugs and as a speculative investment. But I didn't really understand the value of the blockchain until I transferred to the University of Michigan last winter. And I moved in with a fellow named Kennard Hockenhall, who was, uh, th he started the second U.S. Bitcoin exchange in the United States and uh, went through the boost accelerator. When I met him, he, his company had been defrauded and he was kind of restructuring. And he was in Ann Arbor. And, you know, I just happened to move in with all of his former fraternity brothers. And he was crashing with them at the time. And, you know, I was the only one that would humor him about Bitcoin. Uh, because I knew what it was, I had had some positive experiences with it, and so I, I, I listened to him, and well, he's a pretty hardcore anarchist, I, I, he started to talk about this blockchain, and I started to read about it, and found it really compelling. So when I was asked to join the University of Michigan Bitcoin Club, I was like, sure, I'll go, and didn't really make much of it, but my first, my first Michigan Bitcoin Club meetup, a reporter from USA Today comes along, and she's talking about, in the middle of our interview, how there are similar Bitcoin clubs at MIT and Stanford. Now, to, this, to me, this was really interesting because I had recently worked in political campaigns and been really disillusioned by the American political system, but I still had a deep desire to organize. So I asked the reporter to put us in touch with those other students at MIT and Stanford, and she did. And that night, in fact, we ended up on a phone call with them. And Danny, uh, the head of the Michigan Bitcoin Club and who go on to become my co-founder of the CCN, was speaking to those students about their respective successes and failures as clubs, how they could better organize, sharing resources. 
I was like, hey, why don't we create an organization out of this? About a month later, the CCN was born. Fast forward about 10 months later to today, and we're now a, a federally a federal tax-exempt organization, 501c3. We've got chapters in about 35 countries, every habitable continent, and about 160 schools worldwide. Um, we've hosted over two dozen events around the world, and there's no sign of letting up. Uh, and I guess that's a quick summary of CCN, kind of how I got involved. Oh, and my driving factor in founding CCN was that I realized that, look, if I, if I actually had used Bitcoin or seen Bitcoin be purchased and bought and only thought it was good for buying drugs or speculating, and then realizing much later on that it was actually this incredibly transformative technology, maybe as transformative as the Internet, that there was a huge information problem. And that, that was why the need for the CC and arise because there were no professors, academics, professionals really talking about Bitcoin and the blockchain in an intelligent manner. So I thought it was vastly important that we create a generation of what I call cryptocurrency communicators. So Jeremy, um, in your uh, communication with a lot of the students in the College Cryptocurrency Network, what do you find to be the most common story for how people came to find Bitcoin? Um, you have a really fascinating one yourself, but what are sort of the demographics of the, of the people you see and the motivations that are bringing them to this technology? So what really amazes me more than anything is the fact that Bitcoin seems to transcend socioeconomic background, religious beliefs, geographic positioning. I mean, we're in 10 countries in Africa. Uh, we have we have students that have lived through civil wars, uh, you know. And then we have super affluent kids as well. That you know, I mean, they're they're, they're old money in England, you know. Uh, what what the most defining characteristic of of young Bitcoiners is not any given characteristic, but just the notion that this technology has the power to transform the world. So I'll I'll, I'll take an example from one of my students from Ghana, who was saying to me. How he wanted to use, he wanted the people of Ghana to use Bitcoin because they fell so far behind with uh, the internet revolution, and he saw so much potential in this Bitcoin technology that he wanted to bring it to these people, to his people before the rest of the world adopted it. Um, in other places in the world, I mean, it's the idea that you can transfer value or you can decentralize. Some people want to subvert government. You know, it's it, 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 to me. It's just the understanding that this technology is the brink of something extraordinarily special that may not be fully developed yet, but has the potential to change the world. And each and every one of these students want to be a part of that change. Excellent. So, so what's next? Like, what are some of the most ideal communities that you'd want to see sort of involved with Crypt College Cryptocurrency Network? Uh, who's ideal? So, I mean, I think every young person is ideal because there's not a single young person in the world, I mean maybe in very isolated communities, that haven't been affected by the aftermath of 9-11, being in this kind of national security state globally, and then also the, the, this great recession that we've lived through. So I guess to me I want to see the people who can benefit most. I think those people that have been disenfranchised in the past, lack of access to bank accounts, lack of access to the internet, and really see Bitcoin be able to empower those people, cryptocurrencies be able to empower those people. But it, uh, it's a slow process. You know, you have, you have to have education. You have to have the means to kind of help communities embrace this technology. So I, I think we're on the right path. I don't, we don't, I don't really have any target demographics because, like I said, we're, we're in 10 countries in Africa. I'd like to see us expand more in Latin America. We're looking to uh, translate all of our materials uh, to, into Spanish. I think that's a huge target region that we haven't been nearly involved enough in. But overall, I mean, I, if we can stay on the trajectory we've been on uh, for the past 10, month, I'd be, 10 months, I'd be absolutely delighted because we have accomplished so much and our students have done so much without us providing lots of money or anything. So to me, when people ask, do you want to raise a bunch of money, I, I, I'm hesitant because, you know, we have been developed in a very decentralized manner. And when students need money, we'd like to connect them to sponsors and individuals that can help them. But um, 
you know, as an organization, I'm really satisfied with the trajectory that we're on. Excellent. So, so you're talking a little bit about the Latin American markets. Uh, it, can you unwrap that a little bit? What, what's so exciting about you know Central and South America that's, that, that, that really makes you think that uh, Bitcoin really needs to be present there? Well, you look at you look at places like Venezuela and Argentina, places that have experienced horrible horrible hyperinflation. And you know, we complain about the like the collapse and, and the fluctuations in, in Bitcoin, but hyperinflation is a thousand times worse because it only really moves in one way. And you know, the, the 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 people in Venezuela and people in Argentina and elsewhere, you know, they're they're, they're pretty uh, computer savvy folks and with the capital controls that are exist in those countries, Bitcoin has a huge potential to affect those people and help them help them move their money around without kind of government interference. And you know, I'm what most Bitcoiners would call a statist, but but by 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 the the extent of control that the state has over the lives of the people in many countries in Latin America, I think Bitcoin has a huge transformative potential to the uh, for them and you know speaking to some of our students in Argentina you know they had to smuggle the first uh, Bitcoin ATM into that country so I, I know I know there's potential but uh, it, it, it's uh, not that still needs to be fully cracked um, and I think one of this is a little uh, on the last topic regarding the growth that we had talked about a minute ago um, and this is something that I think gives Bitcoin instant credibility so I, I want to laud you for doing this but what are some of the higher profile schools that are involved in the CCN? Because whenever I see the list, I, you mentioned a few, but I want you to mention them again and maybe some other ones that we talk, that you know we didn't talk about. Because when when mainstream media here is academia is adopting this, and I believe I, I think I heard it from you that Princeton has now added a class or a course on Bitcoin. Yep. You hear things like Ivy League schools talking about it. It gives it a credibility that you know really you can't get anywhere else, and it makes people listen way more. So first of all, congratulations. Second of all. Who else is involved? Just name a few of the yeah. of the biggest names. Thank you. I mean, obviously, the founding chapters of Michigan, Stanford, MIT have been huge. MIT, we we gave a hundred dollars in Bitcoin to every undergraduate. It reached almost every single student. Um, that was huge. Obviously, MIT just released a great vi the MIT Bitcoin Club. Our chapter there released a great video yesterday explaining how MIT students could spend Bitcoin. So that's been awesome. Um, Stanford, they're doing academic research. Uh, Susan, Susan Athey, she's a professor there. She does great stuff. Um, our McGill uh, chapter, which was recently incorporated into the CCN, just announced that they're also going to do a Bitcoin drop as well. Uh, the University of Toronto is intimately involved with the Decentral guys in Toronto, and uh, they're, they're looking to host a huge hackathon um, in, in Canada in late spring. Um, overseas, I mean, we have incredible students in Ghana at Kenyatta University in Kenya. Uh, they they've had this uh, the Minister of Finance of Kenya come to their student meetup. So you know, uh, it, it it kind of is all over the world. You you know you know the United States has been a launching ground, but I'm excited to see what happens elsewhere as well. Jeremy, you've had some really incredible success, but I imagine that you've also met with a great deal of skepticism. I'm wondering what the greatest obstacles have been for you and the College Crypto Network um, to actually introducing Bitcoin to academics and academic institutions. And if you want to follow up on that, conversely, what are the greatest obstacles to introducing these to students? So one of the first obstacles we found was when we tried to get the University of Michigan uh, to accept Bitcoin donations. Uh, we thought it would be the easiest thing in the world. You know, it's just like they have nothing to lose. Uh, most large institutions already accept stock and artwork. So, you know, it wouldn't be a far reach, especially using a payment processor such as Bitcoin or uh, BitPay or Coinbase to really just have it immediately converted into fiat, taking on no risk. Um, we kind of pitched all of that to the University of Michigan. And then, and then the, and, and the marketing departments and development departments were all about it. But somewhere along, either in treasury or legal, uh, the the school was just like, no, we're not going to do that. And that was kind of stunning to me. I was like, look, this is just free money you can get. Like, why why won't you take this? But uh, it, it, it's an information bias. It's it, it, or or an information shortfall. 
uh, you know, there's all these negative associations with this technology and not understanding how payment processing works, which shouldn't be a hard thing to do or to explain except when you're not, when you don't get to speak to all the participants. Academics are better. Academics can be very receptive. I speak to a lot of academics and, you know, I think one thing that's actually amazed me about this technology is how uh, receptive academics are, you know. My dad's a college professor. He doesn't get it, but he teaches Chinese history, so I don't really expect him to. But the individuals that choose to take the time to learn how Bitcoin works and understand this blockchain technology and what underlies, underlies Bitcoin, those folks really do get it. Um, Harvey Campbell over at Duke, uh, NYU professors there. Princeton has a whole bunch of Bitcoin development going on. Stanford, like I said, um, you know, there are professors that are receptive to this. Um, they're just kind of scattered. And I think as a lot of PhDs become professors, you're going to see that because there's a lot of academic research being conducted in this space. So as frustrating as uh, it can be to deal with large academic institutions, as long as the academics themselves are beginning to acknowledge the value of this technology, that's incredibly important. You look at Coin Center led by Jerry Brito, who's over at George Mason, and you know that there are these academics in this space. It just takes time, but um, I think I think it's uh, the rate of academic research in this space is going to grow ex exponentially in the coming couple years. That's fantastic to hear. Uh, I think Princeton has done a lot of research into crypto in general. You know, Johns Hopkins University. So it's really exciting to hear. Yeah. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit about Augur. Uh, and why a decent, why a prediction market? You know, what what is the big need in cryptocurrency for a prediction market? Well, it's it's not about cryptocurrency at the end of the day. It's about humans. Uh, you know, uh, betting is a trillion dollar industry, and just over one percent of it occurs online. To me, that's crazy for multiple reasons. First, it's just like betting's an easy thing to do online. Uh, but secondly. Right now, the way that betting is conducted throughout the world, this trillion dollar industry, it has no social net benefit. There's no, there's no positive outcome. You know, some people make, make money, some people lose it. But there's no societal gain. But with prediction markets, there's a huge social benefit. Uh, prediction markets, you know, while some people bet no that something is going to happen, some people bet yes, those bets eventually converge to a percentage, like 63% say, uh, people say something's going to happen and that you can use, that 63% can be used as the actual likelihood that an, an event will occur whether uh, Hillary Clinton gets elected or not. And, and that, that, that percentage, that, uh, that, that convergence has been proven in multiple economic and ec economic studies to actually be an excellent uh, per, uh, indicator of whether something will happen. So if we can take a small fraction of this trillion dollar industry, put it on the blockchain on a prediction market, and have that convergence um, occur in real time, you potentially have the most powerful forecasting tool in human history, while allowing people to do something they do already, but now just in a socially beneficial way. The fact that you, this uses Bitcoin just allows people from all over the world to participate but it's not actually an essential feature of the technology. And I think that's one of the more interesting parts, and that's what got me as a part of the team is, uh, and sold me on it, is the ability to use a cryptocurrency as the way to incentivize uh, good predictions. And, you know, it's something where when you say the word prediction market, you know, I did a lot of studying before I joined the team via Jeremy, documents Jeremy sent me, and, you know, just good old-fashioned Googling. And I kind of realized something, that there is this is lacking. This is a tool that's lacking, and it's a tool that really is something academics really want, social scientists want, um, uh, scientists in general want, mathematicians want, because there is something to this, you know, this accuracy that is in crowds. And to that, what I, what I also think is that as, as statistical methods get more advanced, and by advanced I mean... Uh, more thought out uh, as far as just the entire process. I'm a very Bayesian fan. I had a, had a very good conversation with Joey from the team we were having on next week. And uh, we, we spoke about this when, when I was in San Francisco. And you're going to see that as these sophisticated methods become more in use, they're going to grow and the accuracies just continue to, to, to you know, snowball. And 
again, w with us meeting with Robin Hansen, just speaking with him for a few minutes on this really taught me a lot that this is an idea that is, is thought of by some economists, but so other economists never even thought of this being a method to make better decisions. Um, you know, I, I, and when you Google it and you do more cert research, you realize people are saying things like, it's the killer app for Bitcoin, you know. Academia really wants this. This is something that could benefit a lot of people. There, there's so many interesting aspects that are converging, especially things that interest me all at once here. Um, I can't say enough positive about that, and when that's why when, you know, you say, why Augur? It took me a minute to figure out why Augur, too. But once I figured it out, it was just the pieces fell together. But, um, Eric, I, I'm sure you and James have more awesome questions, so I'm going to toss it back to you to ask Jeremy. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the first, like, initial targets for a, a prediction market, whether it's cryptocurrency or not, right? You know, wh what is, like, the first use case? We talk in entrepreneurship and startups about making sure you nail down a niche. What is that first niche for Augur? So you, you're gonna have you're gonna have multiple markets that are gonna rise very quickly because this is fully decentralized. Uh, some of which will be out of our control. But you know there are a lot of things people like to bet on that they can't right now. Most things, in fact, and th those sorts of markets are gonna be created pretty early on. But markets for presidential elections, especially in foreign countries where people may not have access to these sorts of tools real good like forecasting tools this could be incredibly important um, you know you look you look in m most of Africa most elections are rigged and and the, the idea that there can be kind of this I impartial like forecasting tool that may not reflect what actually occurs in the elections but may reflect the truth or of, of sentiment it, it is very interesting furthermore as a hedging tool especially for like farmers in Latin America that want to hedge against crops that's incredibly powerful because you know they don't may, they may not have agricultural insurance like they have in the developed world um, I can't say for sure what will be the killer apps but I think I think some of the, the apps that people probably can't uh, find right now on the internet will initially draw them to uh, auger and then will end up leading to other more socially beneficial markets being seeded I'm absolutely fascinated by this, Jeremy. Uh, there's an idea in political theory called regime uncertainty, and I can see this, as you were saying, with presidential elections in countries with corrupt governments. This could really help a lot of people. I mean, uh, by removing a lot of that uncertainty about rules that will be coming down or um, various impositions. Um, but what I'm very interested in is how you think um, governments will react to this, actually, um, because it is a betting platform. It does have a lot of... Um, somewhat controversy around it from a legal perspective. But what do you think are the obstacles you'll be facing, and if any, and uh, how, how, how do you plan to move forward in that? In the of course. I mean, legally speaking, we're on very solid ground for Augur as, like, legally being safe. Uh, we don't really follow fall under any um, federal agency's jurisdiction. This is a massive legal gray area. There are no laws that really apply to us. Will we piss off governments? Absolutely. I mean, I studied political strategy in college. It was a major I developed. A big part of it was game theory, but also political science, social psychology, military strategy. And the, the notion that this, this sort of tool like Augur will bring out truth is, is, is incredibly politically dangerous. It, it can incentivize whistleblowing of corruption, of, of misbehavior by governments. And that's incredibly threatening. At the same time, however, once you throw this on the blockchain and it's decentralized, there's not much these governments can do. It's the same thing with Bitcoin. You can ban it, but like I know plenty of Russians that have Bitcoin. Uh, we actually have a secret club over there. So you know, I you, you can you can try to ban a decentralized technology, but once it's out in the open, it, it it's going to be there forever, whether or not it works. I completely agree, and I also think that when it comes to this, there is enough um, layers with using cryptocurrency as the way to as the way to you know benefit from it. I think that's that's another interesting point that you know as we get closer to releasing more about the project that we're going to you know there's going to be a lot of little intricacies that we're going to go into further detail on in the way it's used. So 
you know, it, it's really going to be something that's going to be interesting, but I think we're on the safe side from everything I've seen and all the research that Jeremy and our attorneys and our yet-to-be attorneys, I'm sure, will we'll conclude with us. So we have, like, a lot of people we've spoken with and even more that we're hoping to speak with um, to make sure our ground's covered. Um, and, you know, I think as, as something with Augur, you know, there's so much social benefit and there is such a strong positive need for this in academia that, you know, we, we really think that, you know, the, the title prediction market kind of says it all, and that's why I really like that title, because we're not trying to, you know, act as someone that's taking bets. We're here trying to incentivize good decision making. There's a difference. And, you know, again, I keep quoting Robin Hanson, but I can't, that just because of how impressed I was with hearing him speak. He basically um, just, you know, explained in really clear terms that is what you say you expect and you're hoping to achieve isn't always what you really want to achieve and your decision making can have a lot of influences that are not as simple as is this the best decision they can have social political cultural you know things that are really influencing your decisions that actually you know result in you making that decision not for the best and maybe not the most accurate decision that you could um, these are human behavior things, and the first way to answer that is to get solid data, and, you know, the, the crowd is a really great way to do that. Um, you know, the other thing I learned as, as part of, you know, learning about prediction markets was how many companies also uh, employ prediction markets internally. I know Google's one. Jeremy, I would like, love it if you can go into a little more detail about that because you were you're fascinating when you told me about it. Absolutely. So Tony was like, oh, we should focus on uh, applying prediction markets to companies because, you know, it's a great forecasting tool, especially when people are incentivized to be honest. But in fact, this is actually a, a heavily used tool in, uh, in, internally at IBM, Hewlett Packard, um, Google, as Tony said. The French government uses it. The, 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 the Department of Defense uses uh, these prediction markets. They're, they're a wildly popular tool because it, people are honest about what they think is going to happen and it gives organizations a good sense of how to like how, how reasonable they should be with their predictions. Now sometimes C-suite uh, individuals don't like to have uh, their own estimates uh, being undermined by the crowd but overall this is, these are very popular and effective tools both internally in organizations and societally. That's fantastic. Uh, thanks so much, Je Jeremy, for being able to join us today. Uh, I want to wrap this up with, is there anything remaining that you want to sort of plug? Where can people find out about Augur? Where can they find out about the College Cryptocurrency Network? Uh, tell us some things that you want to plug, and then we, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. We've got some good URLs. Um, uh, for CCN, it's just collegecrypto.org. If you're a student, registration super easy. We'll guide you through the whole process, help you set up a club, get you in touch with good people, get you internships, bring you into this community, which is probably the most important thing that our organization can do. Um, Augur, um, we don't have too much going on right now publicly. You can go to augur.net. Uh, you can sign up for our newsletter. Uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll have alpha and beta testing in the coming months, a crowd sale in May. Uh, but for now, just uh, follow us on Twitter. It's Augur Project. That's, all of our, that's our social media handle for every website. So e easy to access, easy to find. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. My handle's been here the whole time. Um, I'm not that interesting, though. So uh, I think that's all my points. You are. <laughs> You're a fascinating individual, Jeremy. Trust me. Again, Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a very enjoyable chat, and we hope to have you on again in the future. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. Español, English, Deutsch. Normalmente produzco solo videos en inglés y español. Normally I produce only videos en English and Spanish. Normalerweise produciré ich nur videos en English on Spanish. Pero hoy voy a hacer otra excepción y traducirlo también en alemán. But today I make another exception and translate it into German too. Aber heute werde ich nochmal eine Ausnahme machen und es auch in Deutsch übersetzen.
ya algunas semanas tengo escrito en mi lista de tareas por hacer de traducir el video hashtag BTC4. Now already some weeks ago I have written on my to-do list to translate the video BTC4, hashtag BTC4. Schon seit ein paar Wochen habe ich äh, auf meiner To-Do-Liste geschrieben, ähm, den Video BTC4 in Deutsch zu übersetzen. Estoy segura que esta idea puede ayudar a mucha gente económicamente. I'm sure that this can help many people economically. Ich bin sicher, dass diese Idee vielen Leuten äh, finanziell helfen kann. Y da motivación para aprender Bitcoin. And give motivation to learn about Bitcoin. Und motivation geben, um über Bitcoin zu lernen. En este momento el precio de Bitcoin es muy bajo, económico. At the moment the price of Bitcoin is very low, economic. Im Moment ist der Preis von Bitcoin sehr tief. Sería el momento ideal para invertir. Hoy es el 15 de abril 2015. Would be the ideal moment to invest. Today is April 15th, 2015. Es wäre der ideale Moment zu investieren. Heute ist der 15. April 2015. El 27 de marzo 2015 he publicado en mi canal de YouTube Vanos Enigma el primer video sobre hashtag BTC4 explicando cómo me vino esta idea. On March 27th of 2015, um, I published my for the first video about hashtag BTC4 in my channel YouTube Vanos Enigma, explaining how I got the idea. Am 27. März 2015 habe ich in meinem YouTube-Channel Vanos Enigma den ersten, den ersten Video über Hashtag BTC4 veröffentlicht und äh, erzählt, erklärt, wie ich diese Idee bekommen habe. La idea consiste principalmente en lo siguiente. The idea mainly consists in the following. Die idea besteht hauptsächlich en folgenden, folgenden. Imprimir en direcciones de Bitcoin en papel. Diez o mínimo diez o mejor cien. To print Bitcoin directions in paper, at least 10 or better 100. Bitcoin adressen in Papier ausdrucken, um, minimum 10 or besser gleich 100. Y luego poner en cada dirección de Bitcoin una pequeña cantidad de Bitcoin. And then put in every Bitcoin direction a little amount of Bitcoin. Und dann in jede Bitcoin Adresse eine kleine Summe von Bitcoin transferieren. Und 
la próxima vez cuando otra vez ves una persona por la calle pidiendo dinero and the next time you see again a person begging for money on the street und das nächste Mal, wenn du wieder eine Person auf der Straße betteln siehst. Y para tus amigos y amigas. And for your friends, of course. Und für deine Freunde natürlich. O tal vez eh, de Probina en un restaurante. Or maybe a tip in a restaurant. Oder Trinkgeld im Restaurant. Bueno, a la hora de imprimir también copiar y guardar las llaves privadas de Bitcoin, de direcciones de Bitcoin. When you print the Bitcoin addresses, um, copy and save the private keys of the Bitcoin addresses, of course. Wenn man die Bitcoin-Adressen druckt, auch die, äh, auch die privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin-Adress-Schlüsseln, ähm, kopieren und speichern. Y a la hora de distribuir las direcciones de Bitcoin, escribir la fecha, por ejemplo, hoy es el 15 de... Abril 2015, escribir la fecha, más plus cuatro años, eh, igual 15 de abril 2019. And then in the moment when you distribute uh, the Bitcoin addresses, you write the date, for example, today, April 15th, 2015. Plus, plus four years uh, is April 15th, 2019. Und dann in dem Moment, wenn man die Bitcoin-Adressen verteilt, auf das Papier schreiben, das heutige Datum, zum Beispiel 15. April 2015, plus vier Jahre ist gleich 15.04.2019. Luego vas a explicar a la gente, mira, esta es la llave privada, tú y yo la tengo, la tienes. Si no quitas, transfieres este dinero de Bitcoin, eh, en estos cuatro años yo lo vuelvo a tener, tener o sacar. Then you explain to the people, look, this is the private key. I have it and you have it. If you don't take this money, Bitcoin, out of this account, I will take it out in this um, in these four years, at the end of these four years. Und dann erklärst du den Leuten, schau, das ist der private Schlüssel. Ähm, ich und du haben diesen privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin-Schlüssel. Wenn du äh, bis Ende dieser vier Jahre das Geld Bitcoin nicht raus tust, transfer, äh, dann hole ich es zurück. De esta forma das más motivación a la gente para empezar a aprender cómo funciona Bitcoin. This way you give more motivation to the people to learn how the technology of Bitcoin functions. Auf diese Weise gibst du mehr Motivation den Leuten zu lernen, wie die Technologie von Bitcoin funktioniert. En mi video antiguo he explicado eh, cómo he tomado la decisión de los cuatro años. In my old video I explained how I made the decision for the four years. In meinem original video habe ich erklärt, wie ich zu 
die Entscheidung getroffen habe äh, mit den vier Jahren. A continuación voy a pegar este video. Now later I will paste this video. Im Anschluss werde ich diesen Video ankleben. En este momento el precio de Bitcoin es muy económico. Uh, at the moment the price of Bitcoin is very cheap. Pero casi todo el mundo tiene muy poco dinero para invertir. But almost everybody has very little money to invest. Debería decir que esta idea me vino hoy especialmente cuando vi otra vez una chica ahí pidiendo dinero por la calle. Actually, I must say first this idea today I got especially when I saw again um, one girl begging for money in the streets. Me gustaría ayudar, pero yo tampoco me sobra mucho el dinero. I would really like to help everybody, but I, I don't have either too much money. And así que me vino la siguiente idea. So I got the following idea. It's, uh, it's más bien un juego. Uh, it's a rather a game. Um, lo que es muy importante elegir un monedero de Bitcoin que solo tú mismo misma, tienes la llave privada. What is very important to choose um, Bitcoin wallet a company which you only possess the private key. For example, uh, blockchain.info. Por ejemplo, la empresa blockchain.info. Luego, imprimir en papel um, la llave privada y también guardarlo tú mismo. Then to print in paper the private key and uh, of course save for, for yourself that private key. Bueno, ya estamos imprimiendo, imprime por lo menos 10. So now we are already printing, so at least print 10 directions, 10 direcciones. Luego pones algo de Bitcoin, una cantidad, lo que, lo que te da la gana en esta dirección. Then you put some Bitcoin, uh, the amount, whatever you want in, that, in these directions. Y la próxima vez que sales de casa ya tienes algo que dar a los que están ahí pidiendo por la calle. And the next time you go out of the house, you have already something to give for these people who are begging on the streets. Y por ejemplo, y claro, para tus amigos, amigas, and for your friends, of course. Eso da motivación a la gente para aprender Bitcoin y Uh, this gives motivation for the people to learn about Bitcoin. Y la parte del juego consiste en lo siguiente. And the game part uh, consists in the following. Explicas a la gente, mira, esta es la cl clave privada, que es la clave secreta. 
you explain to the people, look, this is the private key, which must be secret. And uh, you have it and uh, me and uh, explicas esa persona y yo mismo la tiene. Y antes pensaba en cinco años, pero luego cambié un poco de idea de hasta cuatro años. First I thought of five years, but then I changed uh, my opinion to four years. Later explain. Después lo expli explico por qué. Les dices, mira, tienes cuatro años para poner esta cantidad de Bitcoin a otra dirección. Si no lo, lo has quitado después de cuatro años, yo lo quito. So you explain them, you have four years to take this Bitcoin out of this direction, of this secret uh, key direction. If uh, you don't do it, uh, I do it after these four years. So you lose this. That's the, this part of the game. It's uh, la parte del juego. He creado este hashtag uh, BTC4 para hacerlo un poco popular. I created this hashtag BTC4 to make it a little popular. Antes pensaba en cinco años, pero luego cambié a cuatro porque te has dado cuenta que en los Simpsons la gente tiene cuatro dedos. Y Solo do, Dios tiene cinco dedos. Um, first, I thought of five years, but then I changed my mind to four years. Um, did you notice that in The Simpsons, people have four fingers and only God has five fingers. Uh, I'll show some pictures. Voy a enseñar algunos imágenes de los Simpsons. De los manos y dedos de Simpsons. Some pictures of the hands and fingers of Simpsons. Uh, pero antes quiero recordar que um, es muy probable que en también cuatro o cinco en los próximos años el valor de Bitcoin puede subir mucho. Just want to remember before that uh, the price of Bitcoin, the value of Bitcoin can rise very much in these next years. Así que si solo pones una cantidad pequeña más tarde puede ser de gran ayuda. Even if you just put a little small amount later, it can be big help. Uh, no solo para... Bueno, es un juego. <laughs> si la persona lo quita antes de cuatro años, para, es para esta persona. Si no, es para ti. Si te recuerdas y guardas bien la llave privada. So uh, it's, this is the game part, if uh, the, the person takes the money out, it's for that person, but if they forget it after these four years, you can take it out, and it can be really... <laughs> bueno, imprimir también la llave pública y la llave privada, y si por ejemplo, okay, first translate. Print not just the private key, but on also the public key. Así que si, por ejemplo, explicas a la gente. Mira, si alguna persona quiere enviarte Bitcoin, pero tú no tienes ninguna dirección, así que puedes dar este, esta llave pública a la persona. Mira, muy bien, la llave pública, no la llave secreta. 
das a esa persona o cualquier persona y te pueden enviar Bitcoin a esa dirección. So, remember uh, the public key you can give to anybody and if somebody wants to send you some Bitcoin and, you, and this person doesn't have, have any, so you have already this public address where they can send you Bitcoin. ¿Qué es Bitcoin? Bitcoin es la primera moneda digital descentralizada. Los Bitcoins son monedas digitales que puedes enviar a través de Internet. Comparado con otras alternativas, Bitcoin tiene numerosas ventajas. Los Bitcoins son transferidos directamente de persona a persona a través de la red sin pasar por un banco u otro intermediario. Esto significa que las comisiones son mucho menores, puedes usarlo en cualquier país, tu cuenta no puede ser congelada y no hay prerequisitos o límites arbitrarios. Miremos cómo funciona. Los bitcoins son generados en todo internet por cualquiera con un programa gratuito llamado Minero de Bitcoin. Crear bitcoins requiere una cierta cantidad de trabajo para cada bloque de monedas. Esta cantidad se ajusta automáticamente por la red, para que los bitcoins siempre sean creados a un ratio predecible y limitado. Tus bitcoins se guardan en tu billetera digital, que te resultará familiar si usas banca digital. Cuando transfieres bitcoins, una firma electrónica es añadida. Pasados unos minutos, la transacción es verificada por el minero y es almacenada permanente y anónimamente por la red. El software de Bitcoin es completamente abierto y cualquiera puede revisar el código. Bitcoin está cambiando las finanzas de la misma manera que la web ha cambiado el periodismo. Cuando cualquiera tiene acceso al mercado global, florecen grandes ideas. Miremos algunos ejemplos de cómo los Bitcoins están usándose hoy en día. Puedes comprar videojuegos, regalos, libros, servidores y calcetines de alpaca. Existen varias casas de cambio donde puedes intercambiar tus bitcoins por dólares, euros y más. Los bitcoins son una gran forma para que pequeños negocios y autónomos reciban publicidad. No cuesta nada empezar a aceptarlos, no hay cargos o comisiones y recibirás negocio adicional de la economía bitcoin. Para tus primeros bitcoins y más información visita weusecoins.com Bueno, ahora voy a enseñar algunas imágenes de los dedos de Simpsons. Now I'll show you some pictures of the fingers of Simpson. The four fingers, los cuatro dedos y cinco dedos de Dios. The four fingers and five fingers of God of Simpsons. Right now, there are more people on the internet than there were on the planet in 1960. We're raising money. And it's easier to be discovered than ever before. It takes a full team to make each one of our videos. But the internet needs better software to help us reward one another for our work. Advertisers value you differently. They say that 1,000 of you is only worth $6. Any help is very much appreciated. Please fund this project. We need your help.
historically and historically opposed to secret societies, secret oaths, and a secret proceedings. We decided long ago the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweigh the dangers which are cited to justify it. Face the facts, join our hands, make a stand. Uh -huh. It's time to gather plans, get the shot, take the chance. Till there is no one left, stay correct to the death. They can't ever break a freedom, we will never let it. The corrupt politics is killing the system. Cynicism is it, and it's everything that you witness. They tell you what to think, make you believe that they're the realness. They feed us full of lies, and yet we always forgive them. Huh? It's all conspiracy, and if you feed an inner witch, you're the puppet, the government's pulling strings from above you. It's time for the introduction to truth. Let's start a movement. We've all been brainwashed. They believe that we all are stupid. We believe in what we see and whatever our ears are hearing. But if you look close, listen, gather your own opinion. You'll understand all the lies, lines, and what's between them. This world is not your oyster. This world is a fucking prison. Come on. happening in our nation. No one will stand up for the fear of assassination. So they strip us of everything. We stand there and just take it. I'm scared to make a stand a false flag operation. Research Illuminati. Find out by 9-11. You see they line their pockets. Don't believe the lies they tell us. Find us, seek the truth. Realize we need to do whatever it is we can to protect our livelihood. It's time for us to do when the conspiracy or not. They owe some explanations to the questions that we got. What are the skull and bones? What is lying beneath? All these secretive meats got you lying between your teeth. What's with the Bilderberg? I'm burning your effigies. I'm praying a Lucifer. How sickness can you be? While all of the time praying you believing in the beast just to keep up appearances within Christianity. Come on. Why we gotta stand for the new 